Review copy provided by NIS America. Speak to any fan of stat-based Japanese tactics role-playing games, and it probably won't be long until someone brings up the Disgaea series. First appearing on the PlayStation 2 back in 2003, Disgaea is a series that has endured due to its intricate and expansive systems-driven gameplay, quirky humour and characters, and bizarre lore. Without getting too deep into things, Disgaea is set primarily in the Netherworld, a bizarre, comedic and somewhat anime-esque interpretation of Hell, where quirky and enigmatic demons and angels vie for power and argue over seemingly innocuous events. While it's an acquired taste for sure, there's an undeniable charm to the silliness on display across almost all entries in the series. On top of this, Disgaea as a series displays some of the most in-depth and long-tail stat-based gameplay seen in the tactical RPG genre. While the main story of most entries can normally be completed in 30 to 40 hours, give or take, to see and do everything will see the game time soar to way past the 100 hour mark, and that's before you even get into min-maxing stats or the now infamous item world, a feature which facilitates near endless grinding for levels and gear. I guess what I'm getting at is that the formula is well practiced by this point, and while many will bounce off the franchise given its particular brand of humour and heavy, almost overwhelming set of stat-based systems, it is definitely one worth recommending to the right person. But regardless of if it resonates with you or not, with the sixth mainline entry being recently announced and copious re-releases and spin-offs being seen over the past 17 years, it looks like fans will be continuing to grind out levels and visit the netherworld for more wacky adventures long into the next generation of consoles and beyond. But for all its variety and weirdness, Disgaea is a franchise known for being, above all else, a hardcore Japanese tactics RPG. And so, it's for that reason that the games we're looking at today are so interesting. 2008 was a busy year for Disgaea. The start of the year would see the release of the much-anticipated Disgaea 3 Absence of Justice, the first entry to be released on Sony's PlayStation 3 console. The middle of the year would see the release of the commendable but ultimately flawed Disgaea 1 DS port, which, if nothing else, would bring the first game and the franchise as a whole to new audiences. Finally, towards the end of the year in Japan, and at the start of the following year in the West, developer Nippon Ichi Software would surprise everyone with a game that confused and intrigued many Disgaea fans. Released as a PSP exclusive, Prinny, Can I Be The Hero, would abandon the turn-based, tactics-driven stat-fest formula and instead try its hand at side-scrolling platforming. Perhaps even more bafflingly, two years later in 2010, fans would receive a sequel titled, and yeah, I'm not making this up, Prinny 2, Dawn of Operation Panties Dude. Seeing a dedicated fanbase from both those who were already familiar with Disgaea and those who simply enjoyed the tone and difficulty of these two games, their presence as niche spin-off titles meant that they would garner somewhat of a cult following over the years. And between the PSP's sad but inevitable demise to make way for newer consoles and the relative rarity of the games in the West in general, it seemed that Prinny was destined to become a faded memory for some and a missed opportunity for others. That was, of course, until 2020, when developer Nippon Ichi Software and publisher NIS America announced that both games would be coming to the Nintendo Switch this October in a newly titled remastered package dubbed Prinny 1 and 2 Exploded and Reloaded. So how does Prinny hold up? What changes are there in this collection? And is it worth a look after all these years? The answer is... Well, I'm not going to tell you now, am I? I mean, you've got to watch the rest of the video. Okay, so before we go any further, I feel like some more background information might be required for the unfamiliar and uninitiated viewer. In the Disgaea universe, Prinnies are weird little penguin creatures with bat wings and peg legs that talk like surfers from Southern California and explode if you throw or hit them too hard. I'm serious, that description is accurate. The in-canon explanation for their existence is that they're all vessels for the souls of humans who have led worthless or depraved lives. According to Netherworld lore, the natural instability of the human soul is what makes them prone to explosion. They are essentially in service to whatever or whoever happens to be their overlord, which is usually some sort of demon royalty, and they act as minions until they have repaid the debt accrued from living such a terrible life. The interesting part is that they occupy essentially a cannon fodder role in the mainline Disgaea series, acting as a pawn would in chess useful for moving enemies and controlling play, but ultimately disposable. Prinny, on the other hand, puts them centre stage, and even riffs off the fact that they're the most unlikely of heroes. Prinny 1 tells the story of one of the Prinnies in the service of series favourite Etna. 
Etna, who originally appeared in the very first Disgaea, is a hot-tempered and somewhat overbearing individual who leads a large group of Prinnies known as the Prinny Squad. Trust me, all of this makes much more sense if you've played the games. At the start of Can I Really Be The Hero, someone steals Etna's favourite dessert, and so she angrily tasks her minions with collecting the various ingredients required to make her another one, and gives them only 10 hours to do it. Fine, then bring me the ultra dessert by tomorrow! If you do, I'll forgive your blatant stupidity. If you don't, you're all getting the axe! Literally. In order to do this, the Prinny, or is it Prinnies? Okay, so it's established at the start of the game that Etna makes the titular Prinny not explode like the others, so he can in fact undertake her quest. But then, when you're playing the game, the player is given a Prinny count, which starts at 1000 and decreases, one by one every time you die. Also, when you do die, you see the Prinny explode. So does that mean one Prinny can explode a thousand times? or that there are a thousand Prinnies undertaking the quest. But if that's the case, what was that scene at the start about with Etna? And why is the game called Can I Be The Hero? Instead of something like, Can't We All Work Together? Anyway, the Prinny, or Prinnies, must traverse the game's six different stages and fight each as boss to retrieve the ingredients to make Etna's replacement dessert. Prinny 2, or... Uh... Prinny 2 Dawn of Operation Panties Dude instead tells the well-worn and well-loved tale of a phantom demon thief who steals someone's pants. Come on, you know it surely. It's a tale as old as time, the old underwear being stolen by a supernatural demon thief, so our protagonist sends her army of penguin creatures to find them? Right? How many times have we heard that story? Anyway, Etna is understandably upset by the theft of her pants, so once again tasks her squad with finding her lost items. Only this time the stakes have gone up. If they don't accomplish her task again in 10 hours, she'll turn them all into panties themselves. I swear, I'm not making this up. All in all, the tales told here are standard fare for anyone who's familiar with the franchise, with dramatic overreactions and bizarre characters at every turn. Similar to the style of humour seen in a lot of Japanese anime, it can often be an acquired taste, but one that is great fun if it resonates. However, beyond its wacky antics, funny characters and silly jokes, there's even less story on display here than that seen in the mainline Disgaea Games series. And so, it should perhaps be treated as a welcome addendum, or a litmus test, for the tone and world of this long-running franchise, instead of anything more revolutionary. While it might seem at first as though both Prinny games are quite basic platformers when compared to fellow entries in the genre, they are in fact much deeper and more complex than they initially appear. But before we get into the actual platforming, let's talk a little bit about the basic structure of both games. Essentially, after the initial tutorial and scene setting cutscenes, players find themselves in a hub world where they can speak to various NPCs, find the odd collectible, partake in tutorials, or select a level to tackle. All stages are unlocked from the start and can therefore be tackled in any order. However, the difficulty still manages to scale through the way it ties into the passage of time. Each level has a star rating which indicates its difficulty. However, when any level is completed, an hour will pass from the initial 10 you were given. Every time an hour passes, the time of day changes, and this will then affect which stage version you get the next time you pick one. Such a system is even expanded in Prinny 2, with different bosses and story elements happening depending on what stages you do at what times of the day. This allows for both player agency and an engineered curve to be applied to the game's difficulty, and it works pretty well for the most part. This isn't to say, however, that both games are not capable of frustrating you with their difficulty, with the later stages of both, in particular, carrying with them significant levels of challenge that even the most seasoned platforming veteran may struggle to overcome. Such a challenge is in no small part a byproduct of some decidedly old school design sensibilities, which at first can almost feel antiquated, but actually soon become some of the game's best features. The best example of this is Prinny's Jump, which initially feels heavy and hard to control. However, what you realise after a while is much like classic old school platformers like Ghouls and Ghosts, this is actually because the player commits to a direction when they jump and will continue going in that direction even if they try and turn or back out. Prinny does have a double jump, which can allow for a single change in direction when initiated, but you are then once again locked into that direction until you land or fall to your death. I know it seems weird, especially if you're used to the more contemporary Twitch style platformers, but once you adapt, it actually adds new layers to Prinny's gameplay, as types of strategy and skill are required that many may have forgotten or never experienced 
given their lack of prevalence in more modern platformers. Also, both games employ the dreaded knockback mechanic seen in old school platformers like Castlevania and the like, meaning precise platforming can be undone and a fall to your death can come quickly, even from the gentlest touch from an enemy. Also, speaking of falling to your death, as mentioned earlier, the player starts out with 1,000 prinnies or lives to burn through. While I never came close to running out, it does add an element of urgency to proceedings, especially on the harder levels, where you can easily burn through 10 to 15 lives at just one particularly difficult section of a stage or boss fight. So with all these mechanics to contend with, what tools does Prinny have to balance the scales? Well, this is one of the few areas where there are some differences between the first and second instalment. In Prinny 1, the player has the aforementioned double jump at their disposal, as well as a twirling move that can be used for dodging and a sprint that can be initiated off the back of it. When it comes to attacking, Prinny has a butt slam, which is used to stun enemies, and then a swipe attack with a projectile-like air variant that is used to damage and defeat foes. This attack is also heavily mashable, and the basic tactic is often to spam the attack button as fast as possible after engineering the right moment to strike, especially in boss fights or when fighting more powerful foes. Like many elements of both games, this may seem simple at first, but things soon become more complex, with certain enemies requiring multiple slams to stun, varying enemy attack movements and patterns, environmental hazards, and challenging platforming all coalescing to form a significantly challenging and complex experience. All of these abilities are also available and work pretty much the same in Prinny 2. However, on top of these, you also have several other abilities, some of which are tied to the reworked combo meter. The combo meter in both games is situated at the bottom of the screen and increases whenever an enemy is hit or one of the dessert collectibles scattered throughout each stage is collected. The thing is, this meter served little purpose in the first game, simply yielding another pickup when the player was able to max it out, giving them no more or less advantage. Prinny 2, on the other hand, changes things up, allowing the player to enter break mode when the combo meter is filled, a state which makes attacks more powerful and also grants an offensive version of the twirling dodge move mentioned earlier, which can damage enemies until the gauge runs dry. On top of this, the player also has a new diving attack in the second game, which can decimate rows of enemies with relative ease. However, much like everything in Prinny 1 and 2, this is again a risk-reward mechanic, as if the enemy you're taking on is too powerful, they will likely not be killed by your diving attack, and you will collide with them, taking damage or even causing death on higher difficulties. Speaking of which, let's talk about difficulty, and the various options that are available. In Prinny 1, you simply have standard difficulty and a harder mode dubbed Hell's Finest. The difference between these two modes is pretty simple, with no changes to boss or level difficulty being seen between them, and only the number of hits the player can take being affected. Put simply, Standard Mode allows you to be hit three times before you are killed. Hell's Finest Mode, you die in one hit. Prinny 2, on the other hand, has a third, slightly mean-spirited difficulty setting on top of these two, titled Baby Mode. On Baby Mode, you are still afforded three hits before death, but safety blocks are added to each level to make platforming easier. Oh yeah, and your life icons are now diapers. Because babies wear diapers. Do you get it? Do you see what they did there? Because... Diapers. Regardless of what difficulty you play on, you're not in for a relaxing ride. Both Prinny games are known for steep levels of difficulty, and while they're not the hardest platformers ever made by some stretch, they are still very, very challenging in places. Finally, let's talk about probably my favourite element of both Prinny games, the boss fights. As mentioned earlier, after beating each stage, you will then be confronted by a boss. These range from large, single enemies with massive health pools, to multiple smaller foes that have to be tackled in a particular order for maximum efficiency and everything in between. In short, barring a few outliers, which can be extremely frustrating, these were by far the highlight of both Prinny games for me, with what seemed initially like basic systems being used in interesting and inventive ways to create confrontations that really require strategy and skill in equal measure to overcome. When it comes to presentation, it's worth remembering that both these games started life as PSP exclusives. Of course, that's no knock against the PSP. It's a great system capable of producing beautiful games, but time and technology have moved fast, and so the term dated must still sometimes be applied here. In terms of the re-release, the games have both been up to run at higher resolutions, and have also seemingly been optimised a little for Nintendo's hybrid system. In terms of the art style, this is another element of almost all Disgaea games that can be divisive. The game's lower resolution sprite-based look, which began on the PS2, 
actually stayed relatively unchanged through much of the HD era and has only seen an update in more recent titles. Still, regardless of how you feel about how the game looks in general, I would say the characters are the clear winners here, with backgrounds occasionally looking a little rough, especially in the first game. While these are minor complaints about games that look decent when they launched and really were never designed to be graphical showcases, it would have been nice to maybe see redrawn HD sprites for the character models, like in the recently released Disgaea 1 Complete, or even newly created backgrounds to replace the somewhat aged PSP era ones. However, where things are no doubt going to become even more divisive are with the game's sound, specifically its voice acting. Both Prinny 1 and 2 have the option to be played with English or Japanese dialogue, which is a welcome addition. However, Disgaea in general has a very distinct style and tone, which is seemingly most notable in its dialogue and the way it's delivered. For me, this tone feels a little less jarring in the Japanese dub, given the clear anime-like nature of its presentation. However, when experienced in English in particular, the dub can get a little annoying at times, with over-the-top performances sometimes coming off as embarrassing or cringeworthy, and some of the overused jokes occasionally failing to land. I mean, I know a chief feature of the Prinny's persona is to say dude a lot, but listen to how many times it's used just in this one conversation. You're the hero, dude! Dude, you're in charge from now on! Uh, why is there only this one scarf, dude? Don't worry, dude. If you go down, we'll just give it to whoever's next. We'll be cheering from the shadows, dude! Give it your pretty best, dude! Give it your pretty best, dude! Give it your pretty best, dude! I guess what it comes down to is individual preference. Personally, as a fan of anime and Japanese media in general, I find this series charming and amusing for the most part, with the occasional cringy moments here and there. Such an issue is one mediated by playing the game in Japanese, for me at least, as it feels a little less awkward and more tonally in keeping. Either way, none of this is enough to ruin the platforming, and all story sequences can easily be skipped if it's getting on your nerves too much. So, unlike the mainline Disgaea games, which are seemingly designed as time sinks above almost everything else, Pretty 1 and 2 are much shorter experiences, clocking in at around 8 to 12 hours each. There is some replay value if you want to get all the largely pointless and mildly frustrating collectibles, which in the first game at least, require you to basically slam every square inch of every stage to find. Or if you want to experience every map in the game at every time of day, fight all the different bosses that this can bring in the second game, or even play through higher difficulties. Still, even without any of this, roughly 20 to 25 hours for two platformers is pretty good going. I guess it might have been nice to include some extra content here to make the remaster more of a tempting package to those who own or have played the original games already. But from a pure value for money standpoint, there's a lot worse out there in this genre. Also, it's seemingly good news on the bug front too, as I found no significant issues in any of my playthroughs, barring the odd texture issue here and there, one instance of audio cutoff, and a missed jump or two that may have been my own fault. And this is before an inevitable day one patch. Hmm. Prinny 1 and 2 Exploded and Reloaded is the optimum way to play two great platformers that fans of the genre, particularly in the West, may have missed. While those familiar or even partial to the series from which these games spawned will undoubtedly have a better time, and the old school sensibilities on display within both games will no doubt feel antiquated and alien to some, there is still plenty on offer here. Having said this, a little more could have been done with both games' aesthetics to make them feel a little bit more up to date, and the opportunity was missed to add some extra content to make the collection more appealing to returning players. As it stands, this is a somewhat bare-bones collection of two interesting spin-offs that many may have never played. If you're looking for some challenging and offbeat anime-inspired platforming, or just a litmus test for the Disguise series in general, then it might be worth you checking out this weird collection of games that few asked for, but many have enjoyed.